Thanks everyone for coming. Really appreciate the turnout. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, deploying Docker containers to the cloud. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah? All right. Okay. Awesome. So uh, my name is Ryan Baxter. I uh, am a developer advocate and I work for IBM and primarily focus on our cloud platform called Bluemix, which we'll talk a little bit about uh, today uh, as well in the course of the, the presentation and demo. Uh, I'm from Boston, Massachusetts, uh, on the other side of the country. Uh, a little bit colder over there, but uh, yeah, cool place to live. Uh, if you're interested in reaching out to me, obviously you can come and find me. I'll be here the rest of the week at the conference. Um, I'll be around. Uh, you'll probably be able to find me at the uh, IBM booth in the expo hall. Um, but if after the conference, for some reason, uh, you want to get in touch with me, uh, the best way to do that is to find me on Twitter. I'm at Ryan J. Baxter. Uh, there. Uh, you can follow me or tweet at me or whatever you like. Uh, and you can also check out my blog, ryanjbaxter.com, uh, where I blog about many different topics, including Docker or various other cloud topics as well. Uh, before we get started, I just want to let everyone know about a really cool opportunity. If you like free stuff, uh, and who doesn't like free stuff, you should stop by our Bluemix booth. We're giving away three GoPro, GoPro Hero 4 Blacks. They're really nice. They're like $400 a piece. Um, so you just got to stop by, drop a business card in a bowl, and we're doing three drawings, one for each day uh, of the conference. So be sure to stop by, uh, and hopefully you ask us a little bit about what Bluemix is and how we can help you too. All right, so that's enough of that stuff. Uh, so let's get started with the presentation here. And I, I think to, before we kind of talk about Docker, I want to talk a little bit about one of the motivations behind Docker and, um, and uh, one of the pro problems it potentially solves for us. Um, so who here is familiar with Docker? All right, that's good. Because I'm not going to do an introduction to Docker. That's not what this is all about. I'm going to assume that you know what Docker is. You know you've used it before, probably played around with it a little bit. Um, but maybe you're looking for how to use it or maybe interested in deploying it, to, using it in the cloud or whatnot. So I think we're all kind of, uh, if we're all developers here, we're all kind of under the same pressure to, to, to make sure that we're getting our deployments uh, out to our customers uh, as fast as possible, right? We're uh, gone are the days of, of waterfall development where we would do uh, um, shove a lot of code into a release and over the course of, of, course of six months or a year or whatever, uh, we, we'd have this release come out and then we'd give it all to, to our, our customers. Um, but, uh, you know, that, that's kind of a bad model because we want to get feedback very quickly. We want to get things into the hands of our users as fast as possible. So our deployment cycles or in, uh, and development cycles are getting a lot shorter, right? And we're all kind of familiar with uh, uh, with agile development and whatnot at this point. Um, so uh, our deployment cycles are getting much faster. Uh, and the way we're doing this is by practicing things like continuous integration and continuous delivery, right? So we're uh, writing a small amount of code, we're, we're delivering it into our source control system and, uh, and it's going ahead and getting deployed, right? And, and in some cases, you know, some people might be practicing, you know, uh, or doing deployments once every couple of weeks or uh, once a week or something like that, but you know we have the 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 holy grail of continuous delivery, where we're doing deployments every single day, multiple times a day, out into production, uh, and, and users are getting uh, our code really really fast, right? Um, and uh, we strive to be that awesome, but uh, not all of us can get there. But regardless, we're we're making we're making progress. One of the the things that happens when you practice continuous integration, continuous delivery, is you end up having these. Uh, multiple uh, environments where your code uh, travels through, right? It, it goes through, um, uh, starts off in your development environment as you're, as you're writing the code, um, and then uh, it will probably proceed, hopefully, to some testing environment. If anyone skips the testing environment, I'd like to know how you do that. Uh, but uh, hopefully it goes into some time t type of testing environment where there's probably some automated tests that are happening. And maybe you even have test engineers that are actually banging on the code a little bit uh, to make sure that things are, are, um, uh, are fine. Uh, but we're trying to find any potential issues at, at this point uh, with the new code. Um, then it's going to go into some type of staging environment, right? And the staging environment is supposed to replicate production uh, as, as much as possible and be as close to, uh, uh, to production as, as, as possible. And at this point, we're probably doing a little bit of integration testing. There's probably other systems, other components that are now uh, interacting with the code that weren't before and trying to find even uh, uh, more issues before we, we get into uh, the last stage, which is production, right? And this is where uh, it's live. The end users are using it, right? And, and uh, 
at this point we find any issues, we're, we're in trouble. Um, but there's kind of an overarching uh, system in place here that uh, uh, any of these environments, or all of them, or a portion of them, might be running in the cloud. Okay. Um, who here is running uh, applications in the cloud today? Okay, a good number of you. That's good. So, um, yeah, so I, I assume that most of you have some of the, at least some of these, these environments running in a cloud environment um, um, where your application is, is being uh, uh, moved from, from one stage to the next. Um, but the problem when we have these different environments is we often find issues along the way where we didn't see issues before, right? So who here has either said this or has had it said to them uh, where they say, you know, it, it worked for me, you know, I don't know what's wrong, right? It, everyone said it. I've said it. People have said it to me. Uh, and it, when, when it happens, when something is perfectly fine in one environment, you move it to another environment, and it doesn't work there, you're like perplexed, right? And then eventually you go back and look at the, the code, and sometimes you say, how did this ever work at all, right? I have no idea. Uh, but, you know, we, we hear this all the time. It works for me. Uh, I didn't have this issue in this environment, but, you know, as much as we try to make these different environments, our development, our production, our staging uh, environments the same, um, oftentimes there's just differences, right? Uh, is the hardware differences or you know, configuration differences, things that we just can't you know, just get right and, and straight in every single environment. So this is one of the cool things about Docker, is that Docker can help solve this problem. Because what happens with, uh, with Docker is that um, when you package your application up in a Docker container, um, it includes uh, not only the application, but all the environment, the configuration, everything about running the application is inside this one little binary, right? Uh, and when you run that binary, it's guaranteed to run exactly the same as it does on a different machine, right? So you don't have this problem of, well, it, was, it worked here, but didn't work there, right? Because it's exactly the same no matter what machine you're running it on. Uh, and it is exactly the same whether you're doing it locally on your develop machine, uh, in a data center, in your own organization, or in the cloud, right, which is really nice. Um, so for those of you not really familiar with what Docker is, I'll just kind of give a, a little bit of a, a short explanation about it. So Docker leverages a technology called Linux containers. And Linux containers is actually not something that's new at all. Um, it's been around for a while. Uh, if you're not familiar with what containers are, a lot of people like to start out thinking of them kind of like VMs, right? You kind of think of them like that. They're a little bit different than VMs um, in that uh, VMs kind of replicate the entire, you know, stack, everything up from the hardware up to, you know, everything, the operating system. Uh, and uh, uh, Docker containers actually leverage the underlying operating system. Um, so instead of replicating hardware and operating system and all this other stuff, um, it just leverages the underlying operating system instead, which makes them, which has several benefits, which we'll talk about here in a second. So one of the cool things that Docker did with Linux containers is they made this whole thing open source, right? Um, and this whole technology is open source. So that means that anyone in the room can go and get it, can use it, and run it um, and free of charge, right? Which is always a popular thing. Free is always good. Like I started out in the beginning of the session saying, who doesn't like free stuff, right? Um, free is always good. So, uh, and that the other benefit is that you can enhance this technology, right? It's open source, so if you want to change it in some way or enhance it and make it better, uh, go ahead and submit a pull request, and, and hopefully that will get integrated into, into Docker and everyone else can benefit from it. So, number one thing is it's open source, right? It runs on top of Linux. Um, so, right now it only runs on top of Linux, although I know they've been trying to make Docker run on top of uh, Windows and, and uh, OS X as well. But right now it's just Linux based which is okay because Linux is free too, right? So uh, everyone probably has a, a number of, of Linux machines uh, that they run or, uh, or, or uh, run or have in the cloud. Um, but it's, it's really great, lightweight, it runs on top of Linux. Um, like I said, it's lightweight, it's much more lightweight than VMs, right? So um, uh, that means that moving around a VM can be multiple gigabytes, moving around a dock container is much smaller. Uh, that makes it much more portable. You can give it to other people. You can move it from one environment to the next, and it's, it's very quick and easy to do that. Um, Docker truly does have this write once, run everywhere mentality, right? This is really great because I can write uh, my application, package it up in a Docker container, and as long as I have Linux and as long as I have Docker installed on that Linux box, I can run that application there. There's nothing else that's required for me to, to run it, um, which is great. And I can run it across on my develop machine. I, like I said before, I can run it on my develop machine. I can run it in my data center. I can run it in the cloud. 
Another really cool thing that Docker introduces is versioning of Linux containers. So unlike uh, VMs where you, know, you make a change to a VM and you messed it up and now you're in trouble, uh, we have versioning with Docker containers just like we have versioning with our source control. So that I can, uh, if I mess up my Docker container by making a change in some way, I can uh, roll it back to a previous version and I don't really need to worry about that, which is awesome. Another really awesome thing is Docker Hub. Um, Docker Hub is just like GitHub, but for containers. So uh, anyone can go ahead and publish a container up to Docker Hub and then anyone can go ahead and pull that container down uh, and use it. And it's really popular for open source projects. Many open source projects publish uh, containerized versions of their applications up to Docker Hub, uh, allowing everyone in the world to then go ahead and use them. Uh, obviously not everyone wants to use Docker Hub. Sometimes you want the functionality of Docker Hub, but you don't want it to be public and open, and specifically in the enterprise. Um, so we have private registries as well, where you can publish uh, container images up to private registries, and people inside your own organization can then pull them down. Um, so it's kind of like a private Docker Hub for just your organization, which is really nice. So enough about Docker, uh, but what about Docker in the cloud? And Docker specifically in this case, since we're in a sponsored track, track and I'm from IBM, uh, Docker and Bluemix. And what is Bluemix and all this, you know, this thing that you're here to talk about, Ryan? Um, so Bluemix is our cloud platform. So if you didn't know that IBM has a cloud platform, we do. Um, it's uh, like most cloud platforms, it's all about getting your applications deployed and running in the cloud as fast and as easy as possible. Uh, and you can do that in three different ways. So um, uh, we offer kind of a traditional model of, of going and getting a VM and SSHing into that VM. Thank you for closing that door. It was annoying me too. Um, uh, you can go get a VM, SSH into that VM, and, uh, uh, and you know, deploy and install whatever software you'd like. Uh, we also have a platform as a service model, which is also really cool, but I'm not really going to talk too much about it today. It's based on top of another open source uh, project called Cloud Foundry. Um, uh, but you can choose to deploy your applications that way. And then obviously the third model is to use Docker containers and use our IBM container service, so package your application up as a Docker container and deploy it to our cloud as that. Um, when, uh, once your application is up in uh, Bluemix, uh, the image is deployed to Bluemix, you can then select uh, whatever container you'd like to uh, deploy and run inside of Bluemix. That's that middle, that middle row there is listing all the containers. Um, uh, you can see that we, and I'll talk a little bit about this in a live demo, um, we have some prepackaged containers that you can run and then we also have, you have the ability to upload your own as well. Um, and uh, we also, the other cool thing about Bluemix is that besides running your applications, oftentimes you need uh, services that go around them. So your application will need a database or it will need a message queue or it needs a caching service or something like that. Um, and oftentimes you're left to setting all that stuff up yourself. but uh, with Bluemix, we have a catalog of cloud-based services that you can pick and choose from. So it includes all kinds of databases and all kinds of caching services and message queues. And it's not just stuff from IBM. It's our partners. It's open source stuff. Uh, all there for you to click and choose and run and buy and all that fun stuff, right? So it's literally just like you know, shopping for, for services you want. Are these, these are not necessarily containers, no. And they're not, these services are not necessarily even running in our cloud, right? Either they're they're all over the place. Um, yeah. yeah, so they're, they're like cloud-based services, things like, uh, you know, you'll see later in the demo, like Redis, Redis Cloud or, or Memcache or something like that, right? So I can upload my own containers to this system? Yep, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit, yep. So um, why would you ever want to use Bluemix to run your Docker containers. Well, what, you know, Ryan, you said it's Docker is open source. Why can't I just deploy, you know, Docker to my own data center and, and go ahead and run my containers in my own data center? What, what's the benefit of using Bluemix with Docker? Well, when you go and, and do that and, and start running your, your Docker containers in production, it's a lot more complicated than just running a little container on your machine. Running a container on your machine is easy, right? You Docker run, specify your Docker image, and bam, it's up and running. But now when we talk about doing that in production uh, and, and actually having production applications running inside Docker containers, there's a lot of stuff that you need to think about. Uh, for example, how, what, you, know, you need like a cluster of Docker daemons that are going to be running your containers, right? So you have to manage all that, right? Uh, you need to know which containers are running on which machines, how many containers are running on which machines. Is there space to put another container on that machine? 
Uh, how do I monitor the different containers that are running on these machines? What if one of the containers dies? You know, all these things that come up with running Docker in production you don't really think about in the beginning until you actually really want to do it. Uh, and there's, there's several different projects out there that, um, that are meant to solve these problems, right? It's things like Kubernetes and Mesos. Who's heard of those things? Most people, okay. So if you haven't heard of them, you should probably go take a look at them. But they're open source projects that are really popular for dealing with kind of Docker orchestration issues in production. The issue with them, and there's nothing wrong with them, but the issue that, that you have to make the decision about is do you actually want to run and maintain those environments and that software in your own data center, or would you rather use a cloud provider and have them do it, right? So Bluemix is the cloud solution to this, right? So that they do all the orchestration, you just tell them which containers, you, you tell us which containers you want to deploy, we run them, you don't have to worry about, you know, is there enough capacity on this, this Docker daemon to run another Docker container, and what about monitoring and logging and all this other stuff, right? So Bluemix takes care of that. So what are the, some of the stuff that you get with Bluemix uh, when you start deploying your Docker containers with Bluemix? Well, the first thing you get is a private registry. So you can push your Docker images up to this private registry in Bluemix um, and, and choose which ones you'd like to run. You can interact with the container service in Bluemix via the GUI or the CLI. Uh, choose your poison there, whatever you'd like. Um, like I mentioned, we have 100 plus different cloud-based services that you can integrate into your applications, those databases, those message queues, those caching services, et cetera. Um, one of the cool things uh, we have built into the platform is deployment pipelines. So if you are looking to do kind of continuous integration, continuous delivery, and build your application, package it in a Docker image, deploy that image to your private registry, and then deploy a container based on that image, that can all be automated inside the platform. Or you don't have to use Bluemix to do that. You can choose to use your own Jenkins server and have your own deployment pipelines and manage all that stuff outside of Bluemix if you'd like as well. We have various different machine sizes, so you can choose uh, from everything from Docker containers that are running on machines that have, you know, uh, something like 64 megabytes of memory up to things that have multiple gigabytes of memory. So whatever your application uh, requires, we have something that will fit for you. Um, we have something that's called container groups. So this is kind of uh, uh, a, a kind of, you think of it like a group of containers that are meant to run uh, a long running applications, like uh, long lived applications, like web applications, et cetera, right? Um, they sit behind a load balancer. Um, you can have multiple containers running at once and uh, distribute traffic across them. Uh, there's many different benefits to doing that. Um, so if you have like a web application that you want to run as a Docker container, uh, that is probably the option uh, that you'll go for. You can monitor different aspects of your containers, so CPU usage, uh, memory utilization, network performance, et cetera, is all provided by the platform uh, itself. And we also do a really cool thing around vulnerability scanning. So um, you know, if you're uploading Docker images to your private registry or you're pulling in uh, images from Docker Hub into your private registry that you want to run, um, we will scan them for any potential security vulnerabilities that you might have. You know, for example, maybe you're exposing, you have the SSH port wide open in your Docker image, right? And you didn't really realize you did that. Uh, or the, the image you're pulling down from Docker Hub does and, and you didn't know about it. Uh, we will tell you that, that that is open and there's potential security hole there that you probably want to be aware of before you start running that image. Um, all right, so enough about Bluemix and Docker and slides and all that fun stuff. Hopefully, I won't have to resort back to any slides as long as the demo goes OK, but we're going to jump into a demo um, and show you how this all works for real. So um, the best way, I think, to demonstrate you know, Bluemix and Docker and, and, uh, and uh, the, how the two work together is to use you know, a sample application. So, um, I've written a, a very uh, simple application called Blue Chatter. It's out for uh, anyone can go ahead and download it. It's out on, on uh, GitHub under the IBM Bluemix organization. There, um, you can just Google Blue Chatter, and you'll be the first, it'll be the first link that comes up. Uh, but it's a very basic application. It's a it's a Node.js application. Uh, it just it's like a chat application, right? You just send chat messages back and forth. Uh, it's just used for pure demonstration purposes to get a point across, and it also makes them for fun demos because people can go to it and chat live uh, in the middle of the demo, so it's kind of nice. Um, I think I said it's, it's written in Node.js. Um, it does use uh, Redis to do some pub sub functionality, so it makes the, the chat application so it's horizontally scalable, um, so you can have multiple instances of it running, and it will publish uh, chat messages back and forth uh, via the pub sub functionality in Redis. Um, but it's pretty easy to get running itself. 
uh, as long as you, you know how to, to do it. So uh, what I'm just going to do here is just clone the git repo. Uh, can everyone see that? Is that font too big or too small? Sorry. Good? OK. Um, so I'm just going to clone the git repo. And I'm going to jump into the directory I created there. And uh, to get it running, I'm just going to do my normal npm install, right? If you're familiar with Node, this is just going to install all my dependencies uh, needed to run the application. There shouldn't be too many. As long as our internet connection is relatively fast, it won't take too long. Um, and then I can start it up, right? So I can just node app.js, and it's going to start up, right? Um, so the one thing, I, I actually have my Redis server running, so that's why it worked. I was hoping that was actually going to fail. Uh, but I have my Redis server running, and uh, it's connected. You can see it, it, it connected to the Redis client, the Redis server here uh, as well. So it should be up and running on my local on my local machine under 6015, port 6015. So if I go to uh, local host colon 6015, yeah, this is the problem with live demos is typing. There we go. My fingers are a little cold too, so this may help. Ah. All right, we're off to a bad start. All right, there we go. So I'm going to enter a username here and I say, hey, you can say, what's up, right? So all right, everyone gets the idea of what this is going to do, right? I don't really need to do too much of a demo, right? Um, but it's, it's just, you know, a very simple chat application, right? No matter how simple the application really is, the problem here is that, okay, you guys, you know, one of you guys wants to run it, right? But you're not a Node guy, right? Or you don't have Node installed. You don't have NPM installed. You don't have Redis installed. So now you're left with, before you can even run this application, you need to go download ver Node, you need to go download and install NPM, you need to go download and install Redis. Oh, and by the way, you need to make sure you have the right versions of everything installed as well. Uh, if you don't, things are going to blow up in your face, right? So one way that we can solve this problem is with Docker, right? Because as we mentioned before, Docker will package everything up into a nice little binary image, and you can just run this. So as long as you have Linux and Docker installed, it will just run, right? And it will run exactly the same as it runs on my machine, as it does on your machine, as it does on the cloud, as it does in the data center. So luckily, I have thought of this as well. And um, if we look at the project here, I have what's called Docker file in here. Does everyone know what a Docker file is? All right, all right. This is the file that actually tells Docker how to package this application up uh, as a Docker image. So all it basically does is pull um, this IBM Node image from uh, Bluemix, which is basically a no, uh, a do another Docker image that has Node installed already, has NPM installed already. So that takes care of that stuff. I don't have to install that stuff. It copies all the current code from the current directory into a directory called Blue Chatter. It switches the directory to Blue Chatter, runs NPM install just like I ran NPM install on my local machine, uh, exposes a couple of ports, and then starts up the application by running node app.js. Right? This is exactly the same steps that I took when I ran it on my, on my, on my machine here in this Docker image. So when I build this Docker file, which will build up a Docker image, uh, it's going to run through all these steps and produce a binary thing that, that, that does, has all this already done for you. So how would I do, some, do, do that? Well, I have, to, I have a Docker client already installed uh, on my machine. I have Docker running. So uh, what I would do is do Docker build. And then I'm going to tag this image with some kind of unique tag. So I'm going to just call it blue chatter. And then I'm going to say build the Docker file in the current directory. All right, so what Docker is going to go ahead and do is it's going to go ahead and build uh, um, uh, the, this, this image. Uh, by running through all the steps that I have uh, outlined in my, in my Docker file. Uh, and at the end of the day, we'll have this image produced that then uh, will run this application. Uh, it has NPM installed. It has you know, Node installed. Uh, it has all my application code. And then we can just run a thing, and it will, it will run my application. So hopefully, you can see here it's running it, uh, our NPM install. It's pulling down dependencies, which are failing to get pulled down. That's awesome. So sometimes we have issues with uh, yeah, let me try one thing here. Sorry. Take a Docker machine. I need to restart my Docker machine. 
see if this fixes the problem. I've seen this happen before. Especially when I switch networks quite a bit. No, I think it's, uh, just, I hope it's just this and that should be the issue. Come on, Docker. All right, so let's just do one more thing. Oops. <laughs> All right, let's try that again. That looks much better. OK. So uh, that's going to build up our Docker image here, happening in a much more faster way than it was before. And now if I do Docker, oops, Docker images, you'll see that I have an image for our Blue Chatter application. Great, now I have a Docker image, right? Um, I want to run that Docker image, so I'll do Docker run uh, Ryan J, actually I'll do this, dash I, Ryan, dash I, Ryan J, Baxter, Blue Chatter. So I'm going to run that image. And it's going to start, try to start up and it's going to bomb, right? Does anyone know why it's bombing? No Redis, right? So if we look back at my Docker uh, file here, it says nothing about Redis. The only thing I did here was package up my application inside a container and run that application. But that application is looking and say, I, I want to connect to Redis. You know, where's Redis, right? It's trying to do that. So we could go ahead and, and install and, and put Redis inside this Docker container, right? But actually, uh, if you read a little about, about Docker and what they recommend, they actually recommend only having one process running per Docker container. So that means that we would have our web application process running in one Docker container and Redis running in a separate Docker container. OK, fine. But how do I make the two talk to each other, right? I need the networking work, right? I have two separate containers connected to get, I need to connect them together and get that stuff working, right? So Docker has a pretty cool tool called Docker Compose. Has everyone ever heard of Docker Compose before? All right, so this is a way of kind of uh, stitching, stitching together applications that require multiple containers, right? And it does a lot of the networking hassle, all the stuff that, that, that kind of gets ugly when you start to think about that. So when you use Docker Compose, you have a separate file called Docker Compose YAML. It's a YAML file. Um, if you're not familiar with YAML, it's just a little, little kind of a weird syntax, but uh, I'll explain what's happening here. <coughs> Basically, all this file is doing is defining two Docker containers, right? We have one called web and one called Redis, right? Now this Redis container says image Redis. What is this? Well, this is actually saying, hey, uh, instead of you know, defining you know, how to install Redis, Go to Docker Hub and pull down the Redis image, right? So if we just Google Docker Hub Redis, we'll see that nice, the nice folks at Redis have already put out uh, a Docker image in Docker Hub called Redis, right? So it already has Redis for us, so no need to do that, right? So our, our Docker Compose file just says, oops. Our Docker Compose file just says, go ahead and pull that image from uh, Docker Hub uh, and start that up and run it inside the container called Redis. And then we, in our web container, we're going to build the Docker file in our current directory, expose port 80 and 8080, and link it up to Redis, right? This links part is important because this is what says, hey, I need to talk to this other container here. Um, and what it does is basically make, uh, does some DNS magic where uh, uh, the host name of the Redis container is Redis. So now you can rely on being able to talk to that container just by using that host name. Um, so that's really nice, right? So how do I use this Docker Compose stuff? along with a Docker file that I already have in my application here. So Docker Compose is really nice because it's a separate command line utility, but it has some similar steps. So you say Docker Compose build, and that's going to basically build up um, uh, both of the, all the images in the Docker, uh, the Docker Compose file. So both our web application image as well as the Redis image, uh, and um, I'll package them all together. Um, so it's going through and doing our web application image. Um, it would also go ahead and pull down the Redis image from Docker Hub, but I have already pulled that down, so um, it didn't go ahead and do that, and I did that beforehand in the interest of time because it can take a little bit to happen. Um, but now all I need to do is say Docker Compose up. 
And it starts up two containers, right? You can see here it starts up this Redis container. So we have this Redis container with Redis started up inside of it. And now we've also started our web application container. So uh, now if I go back to my browser here, uh, which was here, and uh, I go, this time I'm going to go to Docker host. And this, this is just some DNS stuff I did locally, so it's pointing to my Docker machine. Um, but this is pointing to the Docker machine on my local machine, uh, the Docker daemon on my local machine. So if I go to Docker host, colon 80, colon 80 in both windows here, and I go ahead and pick some usernames, let's say, Yukon SF rocks, right? We'll see that it's now working. So now I have my application packaged up in a Docker container that I can then, or Docker image, that now I can distribute to anyone, right? They don't need to have Node installed. They don't need to know how to install Node. They don't need to know how to install Redis or use Redis or anything like that. They just got to do the same thing I just did or just run the Docker image. Um, and, and they have the application up and working, right? So we're solving this problem of, you know, having to move applications from one environment to the next and having, you know, configuration that might be slightly different and running into issues because environments are different, right? We have this single binary that can run our application and we can run it anywhere. Now the next step is, next challenge is, right, I've run it all on my local machine, but now I want to run it in the cloud, right? How do I get this application running in the cloud with Docker? So this is where Bluemix is going to come in. So I'm going to jump back to this window here. So you can go to bluemix.net and you can sign up for an account at Bluemix for free for 30 days. So you just go to bluemix.net, you can register and you get a free 30 day trial. Uh, and once you get that trial, once you get your username and password created, you'll be brought to a dashboard and that looks much like this. Um, and you can see across the top here, a number of different options for getting started, right? I have create an app, start containers, run virtual machines, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we're kind of interested in the container portion here. So uh, I'm just going to click on start containers. And uh, hopefully, if, if everything's working correctly here, we'll, we'll see some stuff happen. So it brings you to a page that has a number of containers you can start. Right? When you first register, this is what, exactly what you'll see. Um, there are four base container images that we provide out of the box. Uh, and these are images really meant to, for you to build upon. Right? They don't actually really do anything by themselves. They're meant for you to to start building your own Docker images off of these, right? So we have one for Node, we have one for Liberty, which is for Java developers. We have another one from Node from a company that we, another one for Node that from a company we just acquired called Strong Loop. Uh, we also have a mobile first uh, Docker container image uh, that's meant for the back end of, of mobile applications. I'm not gonna go into exactly what they all do, but you'll see these four things uh, when, you, when you first sign up. The last option here is to add your own, right? So this is what we're interested in doing because we want to add our own image uh, for the application we want to run. If you click on this, it'll bring you to some instructions on how to do that. They're kind of short and sweet, but if you go to view docs, you get the full blown version, the real full version of, of what's going to happen here. Um, the best thing to do is watch this video, right? This, this first YouTube video here kind of explains everything about containers and Bluemix. Uh, it's really nice, uh, but I'm going to skip the video and jump down to um, setting up IBM containers in the CLI, right? I'm a developer. I really like using the CLI um, because it, it makes my life a little bit easier and I'm just quicker to work that way. And we have a number of different options for CLI utilities that you can leverage uh, for interacting with the IBM container service inside of Bluemix, right? The first option, which, and it might be the most simple, it might be the simplest for you depending on how you work, uh, is to just use the native Docker uh, CLI, right? So you can use the, the normal Docker command line utility that you're familiar with and just point it at the Docker daemon running in Bluemix, right? And then you can just run your regular Docker commands. The second option is to use um, uh, a plugin for the Cloud Foundry CLI. Now, Cloud Foundry, like I said before, you might have mentioned is what we based our platform as a service on. Um, it has its own CLI client. We've added a plugin into that CLI client that allows you to interact with both the Cloud Foundry uh, applications as well as the Docker applications you have running in Bluemix. And then there's a third option to install a, a standalone CLI based on Python uh, if you want to go that route. Um, I actually choose to do the second one. Now, if you're a Bluemix user, you're going to be a heavy Bluemix user. Chances are you're going to use both Cloud Foundry applications as well as Docker applications uh, in Bluemix. Um, and 
This allows you to use one CLI to manage both, which is really nice. So I like that option. Uh, the other reason why I like this option is because I like to keep my native Docker client pointed at my Docker daemon running on my local machine. So I can continue to run Docker containers locally using that client, that CLI, uh, and have a separate CLI for dealing with Docker containers in the cloud. Um, so I'm gonna choose, in the demo today, I'm gonna use the second option. But even if you're not familiar with Cloud Foundry, it should be, you, should, you shouldn't have a problem under, uh, understanding what I'm doing because all the commands are exactly the same. Um, they look exactly the same as the native Docker commands. So there's nothing really special about it, just what it begins with. All right, I was just doing a little time check there. So um, let's uh, get this application running in uh, Bluemix. So uh, the first thing I need to do is CF login, right? This is gonna tell me, to, this is gonna allow me to log into Bluemix from the Cloud Foundry CLI. So it's gonna ask for my Bluemix credentials here and uh, it will log me in. And after I've logged in, uh, it will also, I also need to then log into the IBM container service using the plugin for the Cloud Foundry CLI. So the IBM containers plugin is called uh, IC, so you'll see CFIC in a lot of these commands. That stands for IBM containers. Uh, and then I'll say log in here. And then this is gonna log me into um, the IBM container service as well. After I'm done doing that, I'm good to go. Um, now I want to build this, the Docker file that I have uh, for my Blue Chatter application and get it into Bluemix, right? Into my private registry in Bluemix. So I'll do CFIC build. And again, I'm going to tag it just like I did with the, the, the normal Docker command. Um, and oops, and uh, tell it to build uh, the Docker file in the current directory. Uh, now what this is basically going to do is... Um, is upload the contents from the current directory to the Docker daemon in Bluemix and do a Docker build just like I did on my local machine and then push that, that build, uh, that image, sorry, to my private registry in Bluemix. So now I'll have this image there that I can spin up containers from. Um, and uh, anyone who is also in my organization in Bluemix will see this image and they can run the same container uh, that I'm running, right? Um, so here it's, uh, it's just finishing up the build. We'll see it actually do uh, the push to the registry here at the last step uh, will look pretty familiar if you're familiar with pushing Docker images. Sorry, question. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So now it's pushing the image. And once that's done, we'll have our image there. Go internet, go. <coughs> All right, there we go. So now I can do CFIC images just like I would do Docker images and see the list of images there, right? So I see, oh, there's the four, you know, uh, images that everyone sees no matter what, and now I see my blue chatter image as well, right? Um, so the cool thing is that uh, if I jump back to the UI here, oops, and we jump back to the dashboard, and I say I want to start a container, Uh, and I refresh the page. There we go. So now I have this new image called Blue Chatter here, right? So this is the one I just pushed. Um, do we end at 11.20 or 11.25? 11.25? All right, cool. Thank you. I uh, appreciate that. Uh, so I want to uh, start a container based on this image now. So how do I go about doing that? Well, I need to be a little bit careful about what I do here because... Um, remember, my Docker image, my, my application requires Redis, right? And I, I pushed an image and it doesn't have Redis in it. So what is my option here? Well, one option is to push another image to my private registry that is Redis, right? And spin up a container based on that. A better option is actually to leverage what we have as our cloud services in our catalog, right? So instead of running a separate Docker container just running Redis, I would rather leverage some cloud-hosted service that, uh, of Redis instead, right? And if I look in our catalog here in Bluemix, we actually have a service that does that called Redis Cloud. It's, if you're a Redis user, you're probably familiar with it. Cloud-based Redis uh, service that you can use, right? So it's third-party service. 
Uh, and we can actually leverage this service inside our Docker container. Sweet. Now, to do that, I'm going to fully admit here with big warning signs that there's a giant hack to make this work. Okay? Um, and it's only a temporary thing. It's just due to the way uh, Cloud Foundry is currently architected and how our services interact with Cloud Foundry and containers and all this garbage. But it's a giant hack. Basically, you have to create a separate application, a separate Cloud Foundry application, bind the service to that application, and then you can go ahead and use a service in your container, right? And that's what this silly little application is here that I have running. It already has this Redis Cloud service bound to it. I saved you from the hard garbage of me going through and doing that, um, but just know that, that why, that's why that's there and that's how it's going to work. And I already have created an instance of the service beforehand and bound it to this application. I promise that will go away eventually and it won't be as ugly uh, at some point, but um, right now it's the way we have to do it. It does work, so I hope it doesn't make me a liar. But if I go to start containers here and select my blue chatter uh, application, I have the option here to now spin up a container based on, uh, on that image. And um, I can either choose from two options here. I can choose to run a single container, sorry, so just one single container of this, of, of this image or I can choose to run it as what's called a scalable group. Uh, single containers are better for short run, short lived processes that you know might live for a couple minutes or a few seconds and then you're gonna break them down and, and do something else. Um, uh, scalable groups are better for long running applications, like I said at the beginning, web applications that you plan on having up and running for a long period of time. Um, so we're gonna choose to do a scalable group. It also puts a load balancer in front of them. We have multiple instances of, it, of, the, app, of the container running. You can scale them up or down, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and give this container group the name Blue Chatter QCon, and then I'm going to choose to run two instances of it. Um, I can choose to run one, um, but that doesn't really make much sense. Uh, and then I have the option of picking the size of container I want, right? So I have everything from 64 megabytes all the way up to 16 gigabytes uh, of memory. Uh, I just need something that has like 512 megabytes for this, so that should be pretty simple. This is the host name that it will be accessible at. I'm going to expose port 80. I'm also going to choose the option to enable auto recovery. Uh, that will uh, basically do uh, some fancy work. So if one of the container images dies, it will automatically start it up for whatever reason, uh, crashes, you know, whatever. Uh, and then lastly, uh, I have the option of choosing to mount persistent volumes. So if I need persistent storage uh, amongst my containers, I can mount volumes if I want. In this case, I don't need it. Um, uh, I can also set some environment variables that I might need to set, et cetera. Uh, and the last option here is, is the service binding option, right? So this is where I'm going to tell it to use that Redis Cloud service that I, that I want to use uh, um, to run with my application. So I'll, I'll select that as well. And then all I got to do is click Create. And as fast as I would like this to go, who knows how fast it's going to happen. Um, I'm, I'm just going to jump to one that I already have created. Hopefully this will start up by the, by the time we end. We only have seven minutes left, but you can see it's starting now. So uh, it should start up in a couple minutes, but you never know when live demos are in play here. So I'll just show you what this looks like at the end of the day. At the end of the day, you'll have something that, that looks like this once everything's up and running. Uh, you can see I have two instances, two containers running in this group here, one, two. Um, I can go and, and view things like uh, logs and, and monitoring of CPU usage, right? So since this one's been running for a, a decent amount of time, you'll actually probably see, hopefully, um, some useful graphs here of, of CPU utilization, memory utilization, network input and output, et cetera. Uh, I can see logging from the individual containers as well. Uh, hopefully, so there's no data available at the time, but there should be some log messages there. I don't know why it's nothing showing up, but anyways, trust me, there's logs there. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, if we do... Oh, sorry, jumped the wrong window. If we go to this URL here, uh, I want to go back here. Here is our same application running in the cloud as Docker container. Um, that we had running uh, locally as well, right? So uh, this is the application running as a Docker container in Bluemix. 
If you don't believe me, you can jump. Everyone can go ahead and have a nice little fun time if you want by going to... Do, 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 do. If you want to go and play around with the application, you go to that bit.ly URL and you'll, you'll see the, the application running. You can go ahead and enter your own username and chat back and forth if you want to. I really hope someone does because it, sometimes it makes for some good demos um, to see it actually working and it's not just me faking it up here. Hopefully it's not just me faking it. Uh, but that bit.ly URL, so bit.ly uh, slash blue QCon. And uh, let's see if anyone actually took my suggestion there. There we go. Someone, someone decided to do it. Um, so, yeah, it works, right? And uh, I'll also just jump real quickly just to see. So this is the one I just started um, here during the demo, not the one that I pre-canned as well. So we can see that that. Looks like it might be up and running. No, not yet. Still spinning itself up, but um, yeah. So I have about four minutes left, so that's enough time for me to take a couple questions, I think. Uh, if anyone has any questions? Yep. Did you have some sort of version control, like, uh, like the version Yeah, so uh, you have the option of, like I said, basing, like so for, for my application I pulled, uh, let's just get back to my Docker file here. There we go. So for, my, for the Docker file for this application I pulled the, the, um, the, the image uh, of Node from uh, Bluemix, right? Um, I can't remember off the top of my head what version of Node that has. It has some specific version of Node. We have the, the documentation of what version of Node uh, is there in our documentation. Um, but you're free to choose to use anything, right? So you could use the version, any version of, of uh, Node from Docker Hub you want to, right? Or you can write up your own Docker file that installs whatever version of Node you really want to have installed, right? So up to you. Um, it's com you know, completely up to you. You have free will to, to install whatever you want, right? You're always getting whatever our latest version. I don't believe so. I don't believe so. Well, I mean, you might be able to, so, so here it says latest, right? You're pulling the latest tagged uh, image. So you could tell it to pull a specific image that might have a different version of Node installed uh, if you wanted to. I don't know off the top of my head, but I can find out for you if you want. <coughs> okay, yeah, I'm, I'm not 100% sure what version we're using, but I can find out for you if you're, if you're interested. Stop by the booth and I can, I can ask the right people. Anyone else have any other questions? Yep. Yes. How do your application know how to connect to the service? Like arrays or yep. Uh, yeah, I kind of breezed over that just slightly. So I'll, I'll quickly explain it to you. And then uh, if you have other questions about this, um, I could talk more at the booth or afterwards if you want. Yes. So basically, what happens is the credentials for Redis, uh, all this. So if you pick a service and you want to bind to an application, You'll, you're typically going to get a URL as, as well as credentials associated with accessing that service, right? So I, I was when I chose that serv that Redis Cloud service, Redis Cloud gave me a URL to access a Redis instance as well as a username and password to, to connect to that. How did my application know about that stuff? That information is exposed to my application via an environment variable. So my app, my application code, I just coded my application and look for that environment variable. If it's there, then to use that URL and that username and password that was provided to me in that environment variable. So that environment variable is set via, Bluemix sets that, those environment variables automatically for me uh, once I tell it that I want to bind it to that service. Does that make sense? Okay. So you said the service um, binding application is a hack? Slightly, yeah. The roadmap is to just do directly binding to the container instead of having this in-between Cloud Foundry application. Any idea when that will be available? Very soon. I, I don't have a specific date, but it will be as soon as possible. <laughs> yep. 
All right, I think that's it for time. So uh, thank you, everyone. Appreciate it.